Hi, all. Good evening. It is 7 p.m. One second. All right, sorry about that. Hopefully all of you can hear me at home. Um, my name is Kate. I'm the Adult Services Programming Specialist here at the Algonquin Area Public Library District. And I'm joined tonight by my friend, um, local author and historian, Phil Alio. Um, I'm very excited that we're back in the library. I have some folks here with me tonight. We are streaming this on Zoom and we are presenting live simultaneously. So please be patient with us um, as we kind of work through the bugs here. This presentation is being recorded. So if you need to leave early for any reason or you want to view it again, you may do so on AAPLD's YouTube channel at your convenience. Uh, you're in a Zoom webinar, so if you can't see yourself or hear yourself, it's okay. You will be able to see Phil's presentation and hear him speak in just a few moments. Um, very quickly, in just a few minutes, I'm going to launch a short poll to get a feel for how many of you are watching at home. And at the end of today's presentation, there's going to be a short survey. It's five questions that pops up on your screen. And I appreciate your feedback. It really helps me plan for the future. If at any time during this presentation you cannot hear Phil or see his screen, please let me know. I'll be here moderating the Zoom, and I appreciate your feedback. We welcome your questions. You're welcome to submit them either via the chat or the Q&A, which you will find by scrolling along the bottom of your screen. So again, in just a few minutes, I'm going to turn this over to Phil, and I appreciate you all being here tonight. Good to go? Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. Ready to go, right? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming here in attendance tonight. In person, it's good to see some faces in front of me. It's so much easier to talk in front of people than it is to talk into a computer screen and do something totally, you know, just on the internet. So having both you at home watching this as well as the audience here makes us very pleasurable. And just in case you don't know, my name is Phil Alio. I've been a resident of the Dundee area my entire life, moved here when I was three years old. So that's a long time ago, well over 60 years ago. <laughs> and I love the history of this area. It's been my passion for decades. Um, in fact, if you're not, if you didn't see it when you walked in, for those in the audience, there's a number of my books in the back table back there, which are available for purchase if you want to see them. Just, but they're there just for you to look at if you want to. But tonight's presentation, um, the Fox River, its influence on the history of the Fox um, Valley region, this is actually based on a chapter in the book that I did last year, the two volume set, Dundee Township is Forgotten History. It's a 33 chapter book. And this is a chapter out of that book, a little more extensive in this PowerPoint, but pretty much all the information is in the book. So let's get started with this and I hope you enjoy it, it's okay? Okay. Oh, what's happening here? Somebody's not showing the poll here. I don't want to see that. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, when I first started, this happened last time, my clicker doesn't work, but now it's working, so we're in good shape. It always worries me. I think it does it on purpose to give me a little panic attack. <laughs> It does a good job. <laughs> so anyway, well, before we begin, I'd like to express something to you. Now, although I've lived here my entire life, I never fully appreciated the Fox River as much as I do now. The information that I've been able to uncover 
and the impact the Fox River has had on the communities in this region, it's pretty really, truly remarkable. So I'm very excited to have the privilege of sharing the results of my research with you today. So I sincerely hope that you enjoy this program. So to begin with, with our discussion, let's begin with an overview of the Fox River. The Fox River is a tributary of the Illinois River starting its 202 mile journey northwest of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The river drains parts of 11 counties along its course. It flows down to Ottawa, Illinois, where it finally empties into the Illinois River. So collectively, all the towns in Illinois along the Fox River, from the chain of lakes near the Wisconsin border to Ottawa, make up the Fox Valley. Throughout human history, the benefits of rivers and waterways have always been a major contributing factor to the establishment of human habitation, their development, and really their quality of life. So speaking of the Fox River region, just north of Algonquin, where we're at right now, a noted archeologist, Rochelle Lorry, she made this statement. There are traces of human population in this area that date back, now note this, 12,000 years. Isn't that remarkable? So without a doubt, the same is probably true of the entire Fox River region. Now, before the Indians or white men appeared in the Fox Valley, the area was inhabited by a tribe of prehistoric people known as mound builders. This is a book um, that was published in 1873 regarding, it's called Prehistoric Races of the United States. And this book, it dates back to this year, 1873, um, goes into some great details about this. Here's one of the statements in this book. The subordinate valleys of the Rock River, the Fox, Kankakee, and the Illinois Rivers show abundant evidence of former occupancy by the mound builders. So these early inhabitants of the Fox River Valley, they had no beasts of burden, such as horses or donkeys or mules. Their mode of travel was largely by dugout canoe up and down the rivers. Therefore, their settlements and their monumental mounds were uniformly located near or upon the river banks. This is a monumental mound we're looking at right now, which is a Thunderbird effigy mound. That's what it's called. And this is located in Galena, in an area called Casper um, Bluff Reserve. That's about 105 miles just west of here, Galena, Illinois. But this mound, this dates back to 1000 AD. So it's well over a thousand years ago. And you know, you can't tell the size of this mound from this picture, but look at this. Talking 112 feet across. That is major. I mean, I tried to take this photograph myself of this mound, and I couldn't do it on the ground because it's so big. And so somebody, fortunately, was able to get up high. I don't know if they climbed a tree or what they did, but this is taken from pretty high up to get this picture. It's an unbelievable size, this mound here. Here's another one. And this is called, an, uh, again, an effigy mound. This is located in Galena. And this mound is in the shape of a bear. It's the only bear effigy mound that we know about in Illinois. Do you see the bear shape there? Yeah. yeah. Just in case those on, in the, um, in the audience on the online don't see it, I'm going to kind of point it out here. So here's the head over here. Here's the front leg, the paw, the underneath. And then over here, of course, would be the, the top side of the bear. But look at the size of this compared to the people. That's a huge, huge mound. These are called effigy mounds. Now, this photograph here, this is an image that was taken thousands of feet up by a plane using a technology called LIDAR. So it stands for light detection and ranging. So it's, what's different about this kind of um, photograph, it captures the topography of the ground. So you can see the, you know, the, where the high point or a low point 
So it's it's really amazing. And this is this um group is called the Marching Bear Mound Group. It's located in Effigy Mounds National Monument in Iowa. So just to get a little better idea of this here, where that's located at. There it is, about, 100, about 160 miles northwest of where we're at right now, this mound group. But this is a photograph here taken from the ground. And you see the person to the left standing there? So you can see the size of these, uh, again, these, these um, mounds that were built by these prehistoric peoples well over a thousand years ago. Now, just looking at that picture up above where that star is at, on that, um, here, I'm making my pops off here, again, right here. He's, that's where he's standing at, right there in this picture. So that means that the photographer was standing right about there. So you kind of get an idea of where they were at with this here mound. So it's really amazing the size of these FFG mounds that are located really throughout the area. Here's some other mounds. These are conical mounds. A lot of times these were being used for burial. This again is in Ohio. But now this, this is the granddaddy of the mounds anywhere in the world. Anybody here been to Cahokia, Illinois? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. That's, that's where this is located at. Cahokia, for those of you that don't know, is right um, east of St. Louis when you come over the border um, down you know, in Illinois. So Cahokia Mounds is a great location. There's hundreds and hundreds of mounds that are located there. They're all preserved. But this mound here, this is the granddaddy. And I will tell you a little bit about Cahokia. It was a culture that was involved with the Maya. And at one time, some 20,000 Mayans lived there, here in Southern Illinois, on this site. That's more than a thousand years ago. And they built these mounds that were really were rivaling Egypt's great pyramids. And I'm going to tell you why. The size of this mound is unbelievable. The largest of these mounds, now called Monk's Mound, I just showed you, it dominates the site. It's a flat topped pyramid of dirt that covers more than 14 acres and once supported a 5,000 square foot temple. Monk's Mound is bigger than any of the three great pyramids at Giza outside of Cairo. This is the third or fourth biggest pyramid in the world in terms of volume. Isn't that unbelievable? And it's right here in our state, Illinois. That's one of the mounds here. You know, the, um, I may go into this here in detail. I think I'll wait before I say that. Here's just the um, dimensions. If you're looking at 700 feet in depth, 1,000 feet wide, 100 feet high. And it was all done by individuals carrying baskets of dirt. Think of that. How many? It's, un, it's incomprehensible, it really is. So this is the way it would have looked a thousand years ago. And these were built by people, like I said, carrying baskets full of dirt. There were many mounds there. Isn't this amazing? And I mentioned the, uh, that it's 14 acres. You know how big the largest pyramid of Egypt is? The largest pyramid in Egypt in Cairo is 13 acres. So this is 14 acres. So it's this unbelievable size. So these mound builders were here along the Fox River during the same time period, well over a thousand years ago. They were here along the Fox River where we're living. Some of their mounds along the Fox River are still intact. Here's an example, 50 miles just north of here at Big Bend, Wisconsin, are the Maney Ridge Prehistoric Effigy Mounds. And the conical mounds located here date back over 2,000 years. And they're right here, just 50 miles north of here. This, by the way, is on private property. So you can't go there and look at it. Isn't that a shame? <laughs> but now this is cool. This is the first map ever made of our area. This map was made in 1837. And when it was before well, there was anything here, and it was in the first survey, which was published in 1840, but this was made in 1837. And I'm going to tell you something right here in 1837, right here, you know what it says? There's 27 ancient mounds within this, the, the Stata lines. 
So there are 27 mounds right here in our area where we're sitting right now tonight. And I'm gonna tell you something, they're still there right now, but no one knows where it's not ever brought out where they're at because they're protected. Because if people knew where they were at, what would they do? They dig into them, they ruin them. See that there's probably skeletons in these mounds, they're conical mounds. These are sacred. So they're in this area, but it's not public knowledge where they're at. So I'm not at liberty to say, but I'll tell you, they're still here. Isn't that cool? They're right here in our area. Over the centuries, various North American Indian tribes made their way into this region. First, the Illini tribes, followed by the Potawatomis. By the early 1800s, the Potawatomi Indians were the dominant North American Indians that were in this region where we're at today. So what was the Fox Valley region like back then? Well, in the early 1800s, the crisp, clear water of the Fox River ran through this region and it filled it with an abundance of fish and clams. Abundant wildlife prospered, you know, like you have no idea, along this river. So this book, Illinois in 1818, went into some detail about this. And I should first mention that this book is titled Illinois in 1818, but it was originally written in, 18, um, in 1784. No, I'm sorry. It was written, it's called Illinois in 1818, originally written in 1884, but reprinted in 1918. You get that straight? It's Illinois in 1818, written in 1884, reprinted 1918. So the author is speaking about people then alive in or around 1884, okay? So when you read this, this is, uh, keep that in mind. This is for people living 140 years ago. This is what it says. It is difficult for the present inhabitants, those alive in 1884, to realize the extent to which wild game once abounded in the state and the enormous quantities of peltry which were annually exported. The valley of the Illinois River was, at the close of the territorial period, that was 1818, one of the important fur-bearing areas of the Northwest. In 1816, the furs sent out from the various posts of ponds of the Illinois River, note these numbers, included 10,000 deer, 300 bear, 10,000 raccoons. 35,000 muskrats, 400 otter, 300 pounds of beaver, 500 cat and fox, and 100 mink. That, my friends, has been one year what they, what they um, um, were able to use for their furs, 1816. Note that it is speaking about the trappers on the Illinois River in 1816. These were employees of the American Fur Company owned by John Jacob Astor. That was the first American to, um, to become a millionaire, Mr. Astor was. From the company's records, we know that there were about 30 employees working here on the Illinois River in around 1816. So the furs that were sent out in 1816 that we're talking about here, were from these 30 trappers. These 30 trappers, this is what they caught in one year's time. Can you imagine that? It's almost incomprehensible, isn't it? Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Why are the <clears throat> beavers and pounds and the other animals on it? I can't ask the author to find out. They've been long gone. <laughs> I do not know. It's a good question. You know, I really don't know the answers to that. But good observation on your part. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we're talking here about the Illinois River. Okay. But keep this in mind. The Fox River flows into the Illinois River at Ottawa, 60 miles south of here. So, really, it requires no imagination to appreciate that the abundance of wildlife along the Fox River was just as plentiful as it was 60 miles away. You know, just another piece of water. So there were, this is the kind of animals that were around at this time, even along the Fox River. So keep in mind that there were only limited traders, pioneers, and miners in Illinois at this time. 
in 1816. We didn't even become a state until 1818. And you know, the population was of the state in 1818, 35,000 people. That was it when it became a state. And they were located south of here, way south of here. The population making up the 35,000 inhabitants in 1818 were located in Southern Illinois. They were con concentrated along the, and near the Mississippi River, the main artery of transportation at this time. There were no settlers or pioneers in our region at all. There were none. Chicago didn't even exist at this time in 1818. All that existed on the shores of Lake Michigan was a small fort named Fort Dearborn at this time. And at that time, there were only about 120 troopers or soldiers, or whatever you want to call them, in that fort at that time, at this time period. So this whole area you see up here, this is all Indian territory, totally. In 1818, still. Fort Dearborn was over here. There were a couple of miners. There were miners, of course, in Galena as well at this time, but otherwise, it was totally open territory. This is a model of the original Fort Dearborn on Lake Michigan that was built in 1803. This is how it looked. It was pretty small. This is a drawing of Fort Dearborn on the bank of the Chicago River. How would have looked? This is Chicago today. Can you believe it? <laughs> Big difference, isn't it? <laughs> this is cool. This is a map from 1812, and that star that is brought in that shows the location of the fort. So it's about 50 to 100 yards from the outlet to Lake Michigan. But there was nothing other than um, that fort in this whole area. It was totally open. Regarding the Fox River. One of the earliest reports of this region dates back to June of 1823. That's when a U.S. Army exploring party crossed the middle of the Fox River. Led by um, a major named Stephen Long, the expedition was composed of United States regular soldiers and also a number of civilians. In all, about 30 men were involved with this. Um, group. And they were sent out by the United States government in spring of 1823. The party was fitted out at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and moved overland by way of Fort Wayne, Indiana, to Fort Dearborn. And Fort, from Fort Dearborn uh, on over to the Fox River. So I'd like to attempt to aid you in imagining what it was like to be a part of this expedition. You know, journeying from Fort Dearborn at Lake Michigan to the Fox River 40 miles west in 1823, okay? Think of this in your mind. There was not one town. There was not one village or outpost after you left the fort. There was nothing at all. There were no roads at all at that time. It was total prairie. It was virgin territory. territory. All that existed were scattered tribes of Potawatomi Indians. That was all that there was in 1823 when they were on their journey to the Fox River from Fort Dearborn. The entire region was primarily open prairie, literally covered with grass that was so tall it nearly covered a man on horseback. This is how tall the prairie grass was six, eight feet tall, and it covered this area. So this 1823 expedition followed an old Indian path west that may have originally been a buffalo or bison path before that. And it eventually led them to the bank of the Fox River. So where's the location of this crossing? It's literally just a few miles south of here at the head of a group of islands lying in a great bend of the rivers. So you see there on top it says South Elgin, just below South Elgin, where this is located at. So when they got here, they portrayed the river as a fine stream, about 130 yards wide, the scenery of which is varied by several islands scattered throughout its channel. 
So the expedition noted that the river has a fine gravelly bottom and was very easily forded. So this area of Illinois remained in the possession of the Potawatomi Indians even after our statehood in 1818. It wasn't until the 1830s, the early 1830s, that this would change. The Black Hawk War with the Sauk Indians ignited in 1832. And this map outlines the route taken by the Fox and Sauk Indians um, leader, who was Black Hawk, and his thousand, his thousand followers. But you want to know something? His thousand followers, they weren't all braves. There were, the majority of them were old men and women and children. There were only about 200 um, braves with him in this group of a thousand people. And he wasn't here to start a battle, start a war, but we won't go into that tonight. But the bottom line is, you can see here on this um, march here, here it's about Stillman's Run, New Midland, right being right here, which is right by Rockford, how close they came to our area. They came to about within 40 miles of where we're at today, the, the um, Indians on their march up into Wisconsin. So the point is about this, the reason why I'm bringing this up is this, many of the young men that came from the South and the East to fight in this war, this Black Hawk War, they came through this region. Jesse Oldman, who would later become one of Dundee's first settlers was one of these young men who fought in the Black Hawk War. The path these soldiers used to come to the Fox River from Fort Dearborn, by the way, was the same path the expedition party of 1823 used, used nine years ago in 1823, just a few miles south of here. So again, here it is. There's the path that was used by the soldiers. It's a well-known road. You know what it's called today? Army Trail Road. That's why it's called that. Yeah. It's called Army Trail Road because of the fact that this is where these men traveled for the Black Hawk War. Isn't that something? Yeah. Everything has a reason. Behind it. It's just amazing, isn't it? It really is. But this is the point. These soldiers came to the Fox River and they were amazed at the beauty of this Fox River. So upon the return home, these soldiers commented on the beauty of this area. And so when um, the land began, began to be opened up for settlement, guess what? They began, they started coming back here to this area at that time. Here's some examples of detailed expressions or descriptions of the Fox River Valley in the 1830s. This is a newspaper from 1835. And this is from Brooklyn, New York, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna read this to you. Those of you that can't make it up. This person wrote in the paper that went to New York, I left Chicago for Galena on the 26th and arrived here on the 30th. So first of all, it took them four parts of five days to get there, to Galena from Chicago. <laughs> the distance is about 160 miles. The country is not much to my fancy, too much prairie to please me, though the soil is of surpassing fertility. Almost the whole of the northern part of Illinois is one great prairie. Here and there are a few beautiful groves. There are some fine rivers, and indeed the rivers and streams generally have a splendor and gorgeousness of beauty, which I have never seen elsewhere. Fox River, which flows into the Illinois, is one of the most beautiful I ever saw. Isn't that something? Another example, 1833. The prairies are covered with tall grass and beautiful flowers, and the whole together is beyond description. You have to understand something. People out east have never seen a prairie. They never, they had no idea what a prairie looked like with these tall grasses. It only was here in the Midwest, and we don't know today either because it's all gone. The prairies are gone. That used to be here with the tall grasses that stood six to eight feet tall with roots just as deep. They were unbelievable. But these, but, so they were describing this to their friends and families back east. Another example, 1837. 
The whole country, both woodland and prairie, is bedecked with grass and flowers of all colors, which bloom from earliest spring to late autumn. Another one, the view of the prairie as it stretches off before you often appears like a perfect flower garden. Isn't that beautiful? They're 1839. Everywhere, the ground was covered with luxuriant grass and with beautiful flowers that still were in full bloom. And one more, 1840. I was in the midst of a prairie. A world of grass and flowers stretched around me. Acres of wild flowers of every hue glowed around me. What a new and wondrous world of beauty. What a magnificent sight. These glorious ranks, these glorious ranks of flowers, all oh, that you could have one glance at their array. Isn't that amazing? This helps you to think of how beautiful this area that we live in today was when it was still in this pristine natural site, you know, state. Please. Um, do you know the, the descriptions were these coming from men or women? You know what? I think it's coming from both. I didn't, I don't state in here who they were, but I think from local, some of these here, from the way that they describe things, of course, back then people were more descriptive yeah. than they are today too, you know, but I, I think it was still was involved, I really do, but I can't verify that for a fact, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, so anyway, this is the point, it's easy to understand why people desire to make the Fox Valley their home. By signing the Treaty of Chicago in 1833, the Chippewa, the Ottawa, Potawatomi Indians, they relinquished their claim to Northern Illinois. They gave up 5 million acres of land, 7,812 square miles they gave up. And this triggered a flood of white immigrants which started in 1834. This is what took place. All the choice timberland and bordering prairie in the Fox River area was claimed even before the last of the Potawatomis were removed in 1836. These newcomers were called squatters. They could stake a claim, but they could not yet own the land. The area had not yet been surveyed and offered for sale by the federal government. So these early settlers included the founding fathers of this region, the Giffords, what became, would become Elgin, the Oltons and Dundee, the Gilliland and Cornish families in Algonquin, as well as the Carpenter family who would found Carpentersville. All of these pioneer families arrived here along the Fox River in the 1830s. So, the very first pioneers to make the Dundee Carpentersville area their home was a man named Jesse Newman and Joseph Russell. They had left LaPorte, Indiana and were out prospecting, looking for a place to discover that, as they would say, pleased them the most. So the two men arrived here in October of 1834, okay? They pitched a campfire at a site overlooking the beautiful Fox River. They were in awe of the beauty that they beheld overlooking this river. The book, History of Kane County, um, 1908, provided additional details regarding their arrival. Under the subtitle, Dundee Township, this is what this book says. Although they were but prospecting, they did not hesitate but at once staked the claim. And in April, 1835, meantime, having gone back to Indiana to get their family, they took possession and were the first of a, as fine a class of pioneers as has honored any locality by their settlement. So it's saying there, they came here in 1834, went back home, got their families and came on back in 1835. So Jesse Newman, he built his cabin in 1835 at the location of the campfire the, the fall before. Where was that? Do we know? We sure do. <laughs> yeah, so here's a map. And you see their auto engineering up there on the river. 
and you can see Spring Hill Mall. Well, that right there is where he built his camp, his cabin, and where they had his campfire. So let's bring that closer, right there. And see that? Okay. So where that strip mall is at, remember Big Lots? That's where it's at. That's where he built his cabin, right there. Isn't that something? So just north of the Dundee Cemetery, for those of you who don't know. So when these early settlers arrived, they initially lived among or very near to the Potawatomi Indians that were that still remained in the area. Chief Nickelway, his band was located at present day Dundee on the east bank of the river, about a quarter mile south of where Hager Pottery is located. So can you imagine that? You all know where Hager Pottery is pretty much? About a quarter mile south of that, that's where Nickelway, Chief Nickelway and his Potawatomi Indians were living when the white man first came here. And there were six wigwams and about 25 Indians living here in this small village when the first white pioneers arrived. And this is a picture, not of their literal um, wigwams, but pro probably some of them look very similar to this, okay? <clears throat> but now this book, Past and Present, Kane Colony, Illinois. This was written in 1878. And it provided some details of these early days. I'm gonna read this to you. Prominent among the Potawatomi Indians who still lingered in meager numbers along the river was a chief named Nickelway, who with his followers inhabited a cluster of wigwams a little below where the brickyard now lies. The brickyard, just so you know, became Hager Pottery. Originally, it was Hager Brick, and then it became Hager Pottery in 1914. So the brickyard is that location. This once powerful tribe had dwindled to an insignificant hamlet of hucksters and beggars. They visited the whites almost daily, bringing honey, game, fish, which they willingly exchanged flour, rum, and tobacco, generally giving the settler a good bargain. This is from the 1878 book. Isn't that cool? So it's so much fun to be able to go into these old texts and really get things to a closer perspective of how it used to be. So Mr. Jesse Oatman, one of the first pioneers of Dundee, he related a curious incident of a visit, which he and several other settlers made um, to the wigwam shortly after their arrival. So they went to the wigwams, right? And they found the family situated, you know, pretty comfortably for Indians, with four or five acres of land and cultivation, about 80 rods below the brickyard, so not too far away. And he saw, he said there that there were six huts and perhaps 25 Indians. So this is what he went on to say here. I'm not sure what's yeah. As the strangers entered the dwelling of the principal warrior, the mother of the family was engaged in plucking the feathers from a sandhill grain, okay? Which uh, one of her relatives is shot. This operation was quickly performed as she merely pulled the larger feathers from the wings and tail. She then poured a few beans into a kettle of water, doubled up the bird, without any further dressing, and with head, smaller feathers, and entrails in their natural position, placed it up upon the beans to stew, and hung the kettle over the fire. So this was the first Sunday dinner, which Mr. Oatman saw being prepared in Dundee. And it is scarcely necessary to add that he took occasion to leave yeah. before it was cooked, <laughs> regardless of the earnest solicitations of the hospitable squaw that he should remain and eat. <laughs> no way. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. This, are all, this is all from texts from books 140 years ago that bring these um, experiences out. So the 1878 book on King County stated, in a new country, the greatest benefit is conferred not by one who erects a schoolhouse or a church, but by the man who builds a mill. 
They precede all other improvements and are the beacon lights in the van of civilization. So, and why? Because in order to harness the water of the river, um, dams were built and then mill races or water races were dug to control the amount of water flowing into the mill. So the first dam in the dams in the Fox River Valley were made of brush and earth or of logs and stones rather than cement or metal as we have today. So within a short period of time, the Fox River started having dams built upon it. And these were functional dams. The number one function was, of course, like I was saying, water power. So one of the first thoughts of the early settler was to start a sawmill or a grist mill. You know, a sawmill was used to cut lumber, timber, so they could build houses and build buildings. And a grist mill was used so they could feed themselves, feed their animals. So that's why they needed these mills. So between the years of 1836 and 1838, brush dams were constructed in Carpentersville, Elgin, and St. Charles. The first dam to be constructed in Carpentersville was in the spring of 1837, when some of the first pioneers of Dundee, including John Oatman, his sons and son-in-law Thomas Shields, they built this dam with the intention of powering a sawmill. This was a brush dam made up of timber. So it was at the location that they built this where the current dam in Carpentersville now is today. How many are familiar with this dam? Some of you? It's still there right now, but I'm gonna tell you, if you want to see it, you better see it soon. It's going away. It's gonna come up, it's gonna go away this year. They're gonna pull this dam up this year in the fall, fall. So, which is actually a good thing, according to what I've been told. Okay. Is that gonna pull them up? No. Algonquin will stay forever. And the ones and the other ones, like St. Charles and other ones, I don't see them pulling them out for a while yet. But some may be pulled. But the one I've gotten will never be pulled because it's necessary for keeping the water level where it's at because of the boating above the river. Um, but um, that being, I was doing some research on that, and that the Algonquin, I could be wrong, but from what I've found out thus far, that dam in Algonquin was not built in the 1830s. It wasn't built until around 1903 or 1906 or something like that. That's what I read. Now, I'm not sure if that's accurate, okay? But um, the dam in Carpentersville, that was a functional dam being used because most dams were built for power, okay? So the dam I've got from, I think it was built later, but I'm not positive in that topic yet. But focusing on this dam, the one in Carpentersville, the beautiful dam, this picture, I took this picture of myself a couple of years ago. Um, this, but this is how it looks. So this is how it looks today. But the one that they built in the 1830s didn't look like this. It looked more like this. That's a brush dam. So that's what feels closely what it would look like at that time. So when they built the dam, they just don't build the dam. They build a race along with it. A mill race, it's also called a water race. Um, this is where they channel the water to the side of the river where they can control the depth and power or the, the flow of, the, of that channels. So they built, so when Owens built this dam back in the 1830s in Carpentersville, they literally dug out a water race that went about a half a mile south towards Dundee. So for those of you who are familiar where, where, the, where the cemetery is today, it's almost down to that point where they dug out from the dam, this race, this channel that um, to control the water. So that's where the first mill was located at, it was a, 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 a mill for cutting lumber at that location below the um, cemetery today. So they once they got this completed, they erected a sawmill and they commenced converting the surrounding black walnut forest into lumber. So the Fox River, was a resource not just for power, but also for food and travel. As Carpentersville and Dundee were developing, Algonquin, Elgin, St. Charles, and Aurora, they all were just as, at the same time. So transportation, this was a topic of interest between the hamlets that were quickly growing in size. This article I'm gonna read this to you, this is from 1838. 
This is the Milwaukee Sentinel, March 27, 1838, and it ran this article entitled Steam Boating or Steamboat Meeting. So it says the citizens of Fox River Valley held a meeting in McHenry. Their purpose to take into consideration the ideas of building a steamboat to run on the Fox River. They were looking at a steamboat that would run from the village of Elgin to Rochester in Wisconsin territory. It went on to say, the importance of navigating the Fox River by steam power was duly considered and those in attendance were unanimous with the objective of constructing and running a steamboat. So the next part of the article says that um, a number of the people involved with the supporting of the construction of the steamboat included a guy named Henderson and Gifford of Elgin, as well as John Oatman and another person named Goodno of Dundee. So they were involved with this here, um, looking to build the steamboat. And another article, the, the latter part of that article states this, and I thought this was pretty interesting. From the rapid increase of an enterprising, industrious, an intelligent population that are forming settlements in Fox River Valley, their improvements already made and in, in progress speaks in language not to be misunderstood. Their population four years since did not exceed 100 souls. At present time, we have a population of at least 4,000. Our march is onward and let it not be impeded from the want of a few dollars and cents. So yes, there were steamboats navigating on the Fox River. But look at the growth from a few hundred to 4,000 in four years in this general area back then in the 1830s, the next. So another article here. There's talk of running a small steamer on the Fox River for freight and passengers. This was from the 1875 newspaper, 40 years later. And it didn't stop then. Here's another example. J.R. Duff and a party of friends took a spin, a trial spin, on his new steamboat on the river above Algonquin Sunday. That was in 1901 in the paper. 1902, Mr. Duff and a party of friends are navigating the Fox North River north of here on board Mr. Duff's steamboat, which has recently been fitted with a new powerful boiler. They expect to return Saturday. So these were all in articles in the paper back over 100 years ago. So because of the Fox River, locations including Elgin and Carpentersville, they were developing into some major manufacturing facilities. This photo you're looking at here in Carp of Carpentersville was taken in the late 1870s. So remember I was talking a few minutes ago about the water races? Let me just point that out to you. See here the bridge? So this is the Fox River here between these buildings, okay? Um, see this here? That's a water race right there. That's way to the, um, you know, on the west side of the river. So the river's way over here behind this building. So this is a water race that was used to channel the water into the buildings for power. Now I'll show you a little bit better picture. This was taken a little, a little bit later. This is 1887. So here you see very distinctly the Fox River, the, the mill race here, and there's also a mill race on the other side. And that went to the um, grist mill. You know the bicycle, bicycle shop today in Carpentersville? That's the old grist mill. That, this is the water race that was used for that, to feed that back well over 100 years ago. And this is the race on this side. <laughs> This is an old postcard portraying the mill race in Carpentersville as it looked over a century ago. It was beautiful. A portion of this mill race still exists to this day, but it no longer has the beauty that you're seeing in this postcard. Okay. Here's how it used to look. Here's how it looks today. So it's empty, it's not being used anymore, but it's still there. This is the mill race that still exists. This is right along Lincoln Avenue, just before Otto. And not only is this um, race still there, the gate that was used to control the water is still there. There it is. This is a picture of the water gate. It's still there to this day, right now, right there by Lincoln Avenue by Otto. Can you identify this building? How many know what this is? 
Oh, it's by Otto, you're right. This is the powerhouse in the back of my, by his building there, you know, in Carpentersville. This is the old powerhouse. And this is when it was first built in 1909. So this is the powerhouse here that you just saw a picture of. Here's the river coming down. Here's the race. This is the mill race that went to the mill, the bicycle shop I told you about, the grist mill, but it also was used to incorporate this here. There were generators, which I'm going to show you in a second, underneath here in the water that turned the turbines to run the generators. That's how it generated power. And over here, that's the other um, mill race that was built. The first one that was built back in the 1830s, right here. So is Otto still using that? No, he is not. No, oh, right. no, I can't. This is gone. The mill race, it co comes up to this location there for well, almost it does but he's not allowed to use it he actually did rebuild um the generator so i'm going to show you in a minute he rebuilt one that's usable um but they will not allow him to divert the river they say that it, it'll change things i don't see why it's going right back into the river but it won't they won't allow him but this is a generator that was on top uh, that was turned by the turbines and these are the turbines here so there are two of them you see Here's a, this is a smaller one here. This is the one he rebuilt. It's called the starter generator or starter turbine. This is the larger one here that gave all the power. But this does produce some power. I forget how much it is, a limited amount. And it is operational, thanks to Mr. Ambroser, but they will not let him use it. But um, these, these um, turbines were down in the, in the river, like 40 feet down. These went way down. So the water would drop into these here, turn these turbines. So it's just amazing with how they could do things back then. That, by the way, this is from Alice Chalmers. These are the original plans made for that, for the construction of this power plant in 1909. So then this carpenter's belt, when it was um, in its industrial age, some of the growth that took place. This is around 1895, look up the buildings. So many buildings, there. most of them are still there today. Some are gone, but it's a huge industrial complex. Let's go a little further down. Let's go down to, um, to Dundee, shall we? In Dundee's early days, the buildings on Main Street were nothing more than wooden shack. This is the J.P. Bradley shop, which opened in 1860. And you know where the old town pump used to be? or um, Francesca's, I forget what it's called now, the pizza place now. It's right in the corner of 2nd and 1st, 2nd and Main. This is one building in. So before that, that big building was built, this was the second building in, this blacksmith shop. So the building right to the right of it, you're seeing there, that was the corner building on the corner of 2nd and Main right here. Our region of the Fox River was blessed with an additional element that made this region unique. And this book, written in 1870, talks about it. And I'm going to blow this up so you can see it. It's talking here about the clay. It says that clay and loam suitable for the manufacture of brick may be obtained from the drift and surface deposits in various parts of the district. But note this point here. It's a very important point. The best material for this purpose, however, is found in the northern part of Kane County. At the village of Dundee, the clay here, which appears to belong to the drift formation, is quite free from oxides of iron and burns into brick of a delicate pale yellow color in assorted lots, not inferior in appearance to the celebrated Milwaukee brick. So it's talking about the clay in Dundee. And why is that important? Because of the brickyard that was there and the pottery that came there and later on. It was a special clay that was used here and it was noted in this book in 1870. And this is an article here, 1860, talking about a building developed in Belvedere. And this is what they said. Mr. Tompkins is preparing to build his store, which is the corner one of what was once Union Block. And look at this, of Dundee brick. They are of a pale yellow color and as hard as cast iron almost. They're the best brick we have such and look better in a building than red brick. So already in 1860, these bricks from Dundee were being used. They actually go back, the brickyard in Dundee actually goes back to the 1850s. 
it's when it opened. Hager didn't buy it until 1871. It was started in the 1850s. The Dundee Brick Company, oh, I jumped the gun, didn't I? Oh. I needed it, it's easy to do that. The Dundee Brick Company began its operation on the east bank of the Fox River in 1852. So in 1871, David Hager purchased the company and renamed it the D.H. Hager Brick and Tile Works. There's an actual advertisement from 1897 talking about some of those products. So here's a photo of West Dundee as it looked in 1871. The three-story building to the left, named the Hunt Block, has just been completed, and it's built using Hager Brick. What building is that? Can you tell now? Emma. Oh, my God. <laughs> Isn't that something? Was this? What? So, 18 what? 1871. That's when it was built. Uh -huh. it, it's the oldest building on Main Street in West Dundee. 1871. It's the first brick building built on this side of, of, the, um, of the road. There were other brick buildings on the other side. I'll show you in a minute. Um, they were, they might have been, they probably were used of Dundee brick as well, but they're gone. So the one that's standing today is that building, which is the oldest. But by 1890, most of the wooden structures had been replaced with brick buildings, as this picture shows from 1890. And then you go a little further, by the 1900s, Main Street's transformed. This is beautiful. This is how it looks today. All the buildings are ornate brick structures that we have to this day. That's a great picture, isn't it? Here's the bridge in 1877 going over Main Street. <laughs> and this is a photograph from East Dundee looking on over the river to East and to West Dundee. And that's the um, south side of the street. Those buildings you're looking at now that are there, they're all gone. Here they are close up. This picture is the south side of Main Street in Dundee in 1877. These are all brick structures. Um, this entire block was torn down in 1892 in preparation for the construction of the Opera House block, which was completed in 1893. And that's this block here. That's the Opera House, which was here until the 1970s. So if you're an older kind of like me, I remember that building. <laughs> I used to be here not too long ago. Maybe even for the 80s, it was there when it was brought down to a fire. But this entire region, developed because of the Fox River. That's the point. Because of the Fox River, all this took place. So we've already discussed its influence regarding travel and energy. How else did the Fox River influence our communities? Money. The river was a huge source of income and also employment. And this was all year long. During the winter, ice was harvested from the river and proved to be a major source of revenue. There were multiple companies here in the Carpenterville, Dundee, and Elgin area cutting ice on the Fox River. Here we see the, oh, went too far. Here we, let's see here. Let me go back. Okay. We're good. Okay. Here we see the Dundee Ice Company um, wagon. And this is located on the corner of First and Main in West Dundee. So companies such as Swift Foods built huge ice houses here in Dundee along the river. Ice was used during the summer to maintain their huge meat production interests in the Chicago stockyards. Remember Swift Foods? So they were in the stockyards. They cut ice right here in Dundee in Carpenter's Home. And um, it's just amazing what they were able to do. Here's an article talking about the construction of their ice house. The new ice house now in the course of erection in Dundee, look at the size, 300 feet in length, 115 feet in width, and 30 feet in height. It's a 34,500 square foot building. This is back in 1880, they built this. Here in Dundee, actually right above, actually in Carpenter's Zone. Another article, this is from 1882. The harvesting of ice at this point, this is from Dundee, the harvesting of ice at this point has entirely ceased, both on account of the breaking up of the ice fields and the filling of the houses. Probably 15,000 tons have been cut about here. Swift of Chicago, whose mammoth houses 
I just north of the village, began cutting six inch ice at the opening of the season and filled all their space. The last cut by them being 10 and 12 inches thick and all of first class quality, pure and clear. <clears throat> That's how the ice was here. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine 12 inch ice in our river? You never see that today. <laughs> so another thing we're gonna talk about, another source of income that provided um, by the river was its clams or mullet. The Fox River was rich with clams. And this is a photo of clamming on the Fox River. Look at those piles. Those are the clams that were in the Fox River at one time. Isn't that unbelievable? They weren't being caught for food because these freshwater clams, you could eat them, but they don't taste so good. <laughs> okay? They were tough and they were pretty tasteless. So what were they being used for? Uh, shell. What? The shells. The shells. For buttons, you're absolutely correct. But oh. there you go. These clams are being caught for the clothing industry. Buttons for clothing were made from the shell. So North American freshwater clam shells are lined with an iridescent mother of pearl layer, perfect for making beautiful and ornate buttons. So Here's a photo of one of the mother of pearl button factories in Iowa, Muscatine, actually, which is the capital of button manufacturing in the U.S. You know how many buttons were made in this country? In, the, in 1916, the United States was producing close to 6 billion buttons a year from these clamshells. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so it's really unbelievable. Each button cutter stamped from a clamshell such as the one displayed. Look at that clamshell close up. There's eight holes. So they got eight buttons out of this one half shell alone. That's how they did it. So my question is, how do they cut them? How do they cut those without breaking those shells? You know, I have no idea. But this is a good point here. Typically, shells throughout the country sold for about $50 a ton, okay, wow. for these clam shells. You know what the shells in Dundee and Carpentersville sold for? Almost $150 a ton. Almost three times the amount of money for the shells here. And want to know why? Because for some reason, they were more iridescent. They were beautiful inside. And I think I just learned the reason why, visiting the Friends of the Fox, one of the meetings about the dam removal. Underneath this river here is a lot of limestone, which is full of minerals. And that fed the clams. So maybe that's what made them more iridescent because of the minerals. That's what I'm thinking it is. Is that something? So the clam shells here are still for more money for buttons than anywhere else. Here's another photo showing some of the beautiful buttons and also the stamps that were being used. But there's one other source of income that we need to talk about that was derived from the mullets. Pearls. Did you, ever, did you know that pearls were here in the Fox River? Yes, there were pearls. I'm gonna blow you away in a few minutes here. You're not gonna believe this here, okay? Natural pearls were extremely valuable during these years before the development of culture pearls. And some remarkable examples were taken from the Fox River. Pearls selling for $200 back then, which is about $5,000 in today's dollars, were not uncommon. Here's an example from the Crystal Lake Herald newspaper, okay? Stories of large, beautiful pearls found in the shells of Fox River clams have been numerous since the local camping season started. A clam story that eclipses all others is verified today. Five boys will receive $60 within the week for one jewel they found. Three Elgin lads and two Chicago boys are joint owners of the pearl, now in the hands of an Elgin jeweler. The Elgin boys, all under 16 of age, are enjoying an outing at Maplewood. As in 1908, that is $1,850 today. Isn't that crazy? Another example, 1911, reports of valuable pearls found in the Fox River continue to come in. Hilton Smith, who was collecting clam shells above Dundee, found a pearl one day last week, which he believes is worth several hundred dollars. Oliver Few of Elgin, a streetcar conductor, had been in the water only a few minutes and it opened an even dozen of clams without even finding a slug one day recently when luck favored him as he cut into the 13th clam, 
a perfect white pearl weighing more than 11 grains rolled out into his hand. Interested in knowing the value on the pearl, he went you know, to the jeweler, blah, 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 blah. The bottom line is he was offered $200. dollars he did not take it. That is $6,000 today for that pearl. The 1911 article in the record newspaper reported that some $2 million in freshwater pearls were being harvested in Illinois annually with inflation at $60 million today. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so are there any clams left? <laughs> there are some. <laughs> Not like there used to be. But this is, is going to blow you away, this one here. The most valuable pearl ever found on the American continent was found into, in Chicago, into, was brought into Chicago. I'm going to start again. This is the most valuable pearl ever found on the American continent was brought into Chicago recently to be appraised. It was valued at $8,700. It was found by a man named Carr on the Fox River. And the bottom line is this, um, this pearl um, is the largest pearl ever found in North America. And it was found on the Fox River. It's valued back then, $8,700 is worth $249,000 today. Oh, that was found just about, you know, what, what I say, 30, 40 miles south of here. Is that crazy? <laughs> anyway, one last example that we're going to go into and then we're completed. And that is how the Fox River influenced our area. And that is regarding the history of our nation. Because of the Fox River, this nation is chained forever. I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> it wasn't for the Fox River. It's doubtful that Abraham Lincoln would have ever been our 16th president. Why do I say that? The reason Alan Pinkerton wouldn't have been there to foil the 1861 assassination plot when Lincoln was on his way to, from Springfield to Washington to be inaugurated. Why? How many are familiar with the movie classic, It's a Wonderful Life? Sure. I've been telling everybody, everybody, isn't that a great movie? <laughs> well, remember when George, in desperation, jumped into the water to end his life, but um, the angel Clarence saved him? George told him that he wished he had never been born. Remember that? So Clarence decided to show George how life would have been had he not been born. Billy Falls would never have developed. Instead, he was shown that Pottersville with its unsavory elements of mankind abounded. He learned that he wasn't there to save his brother, Harry Bailey, when he broke through the ice at the age of nine. And, and because of that, Harry didn't save the men on the transport and get decorated with the Congressional Medal of Honor. George, just as George Bailey wasn't there to save his brother, Harry, if the Fox River didn't exist, Alan Pinkerton wouldn't have been there to save Abraham Lincoln in 1861. Why? Because Alan Pinkerton wouldn't have ever hired the head of his female detectives, Kate Warren, in 1856, who was instrumental in foiling the president-elect Lincoln assassination. Why? Because the Pinkerton National Detective Agency wouldn't have been founded in 1850. Why? Because his career in law enforcement would have never begun. Why? Because Pinkerton never came upon a counterfeiter's hideout on Bogus Island, located on the Fox River near Algonquin in 1843. Why? Because if there was no Fox River, he would not have been looking on the island for tree saplings to use in his Dundee business of barrel making, Cooperage. Wow. So the events that occurred to Alan Pinkerton here in Dundee on the Fox River in 1843 started the chain of events that led to him saving President-elect Lincoln in 1861. So in reality, without those events, Alan Pinkerton wouldn't have probably continued as a Cooper, or he would have continued as a Cooper for the rest of his life. He would never have become a detective. He would have done what he did his whole life, making barrels. That's what he was doing. So yes, the Fox River has definitely influenced the history of the Fox River region, 
and yes, the history of our nation. In fact, to take it one step further, we can say without a doubt, if the Fox River didn't exist, we wouldn't even be sitting here today. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Because there would be no Carpenters though. There'd be no Dundee, there'd be no Elgin or any, any other town along the banks because it wouldn't be here. So the Fox River is alive, beautiful, majestic, and truly the blood, lifeblood of our community. Thank you. So, do we have any questions? Please. Um, why is it called the Fox River? It's a good question. And no, I know the answer to this here, but I'm not going to look bring it in my mind. The Fox River, I mean, why it's called that. It's, um, and actually, it's called something different, but I, oh, I just, let me, oh, boy. Was that the the, the Indians sock it, fox? It, sock it, fox? Well, no, I don't think so. I think it's something else. Um, but I can't remember what it is. I'm sorry. I don't remember. I have, I have two cells working up here. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody else? <laughs> Any other questions? So did you enjoy that? Did yeah. you explain it? Good, good. Well, I enjoyed doing this. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> there it is. 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 All right. Thank you all who joined us on Zoom once again. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and end the webinar, and you'll see just a short survey pop up in your Zoom client. It's five questions. I appreciate your response, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.